I think we'll just get going really. So welcome everyone to another evening webinar with the Intensive Care Society. My name is Dr. Julie Highfield and I'll be hosting your webinar this evening. We're just waiting and several more people are joining us. So I'll just kind of set things up for this evening. So if you if you haven't got used to a Zoom by now, then then you're probably in, in the minority. But uh, just in case you've never done this before, um, we'll have disabled your video function and your microphone just because that makes it easier to present. Um, I'm going to have my video on and while I'm presenting my slides. And then I've got uh, four speakers sharing their story with me this evening. And I'll introduce those to you as we go along. Um, the speakers and myself are welcome um, questions but if you could save your questions until the end and the best way to do that is actually if you click on the Q&A function and type your questions into the Q&A as you think of them then they don't pop up and disturb us as we're talking but we'll be able to um, answer those questions at the end so we'll be kind of gathering together themes so have a look at the Q&A and if there are things that are, have already been asked you don't need to ask it again. Um, but if there are new questions, then fantastic. Do, um, do join in the conversation. So the plan for this evening, I'm your host. So for those of you who have yet to meet me, here's a good photo of me uh, pre-lockdown with good uh, hair. So uh, if it kind of detracts from my camera photo at the moment. So my name's Dr. Julie Highfield. I am uh, in my clinical day job, a consultant clinical psychologist in intensive care um, in Cardiff. And I just literally this last week started as the national National Wellbeing Project Director for the Intensive Care Society um, this week. So those are my, my kind of two roles. Um, and there's my Twitter handle if you're interested in tweeting. Um, I'll introduce you to my four speakers uh, when we um, get to them. But basically the plan for this evening is as follows. So I'm gonna start with just a little bit of a psychologist perspective on making sense of our reactions so far. Um, and I very much include myself in those reactions. Um, and then we'll be talking about um, four stories. Uh, so our, our kind of co-host will share um, some stories just from the heart, um, both of the good stuff and the bad stuff, the joy and the pain of uh, working in intensive care during this pandemic. Um, so we'll have about sort of 20 minutes or so, five minutes per person for stories. And then at the end, I've just got a few extra slides to kind of talk about um, the things that I've been doing to help individuals during this pandemic, what helps, um, what I think has worked for people, um, and just give you a bit of a quick outline of my new role with the Intensive Care Society and the National Wellbeing Project and how we in the Intensive Care Society want to actually promote positive psychological well-being in intensive care not just for COVID but for um, ongoing um, forevermore. So our story so far well the long and the short of it is that for many work feels like it's really chain shape it's really ramped up a gear to say the least it's really hard to find the words to describe that because they always seem uh, j just so small in comparison to the reality of it uh, for many people um, so just picking out a kind of few key things that I think we're all feeling right now massive uncertainty massive amount of shifting and changing um, and losing a sense of control at times and at other times feeling very, very focused and very in control. Um, our sense of identity has been an interesting one. I, I remember um, reading a, a tweet from someone quite senior saying, I don't think um, we ever quite uh, realized just how much people will now understand what a critical care really is and what that means to us from both a positive and a negative point of view, but also kind of our role and our identity to play for the um, um, 
what our role is and our identity in in terms of our role to play in the the national picture um, and the expectations of us in in critical care um, and without question um, the demand and the effort has ramped up for everyone and I want to mention a particular phrase which we call discretionary effort which is people going above and beyond the call of duty um, and I, I think you know testament to, to you all to keep going here you are many of you not in work many of you on your precious time off uh, listening to an evening webinar on a really sunny night as well so that sort of sense of giving more and wanting to be part of something really really important and I think it's important to kind of think about uh, us in our context of, of our, our kind of crazy NHS right now and, and just, you know, the, the things that feel obvious but really need to be said about that shifting boundaries, those reorganisation, bringing in uh, redeployed staff, changing teams, um, some of that really great and a great sense of help and support and some of it about kind of almost a, a sense of um, I guess kind of losing the social fabric and, and the sense of coming together as a team and diluting kind of pre-existing teams. Um, some of it has been great because of the lack of red tape actually all of a sudden we realized that if we had the money and we were told yes to every question what the nhs could really look like in terms of lifting some barriers um but actually also some barriers are, are there for a reason so the 3 a.m whatsapp is the the boundary that needs putting back in place really um it goes without saying the the kind of the trauma the death the physical risk and the there's sweating like crazy in PPE and worrying about the supply of, of PPE are, are huge. But there's also different ways of working. I'd never even used Zoom before this. And um, now I don't have the excuse if I can't drive there, it's really far. Um, so, you know, connecting so many people through Zoom, but staff kind of feeling more disconnected and working from home and then how it feels for us when we're clinical and working with patients and we don't have those same feelings and I think it, it, it goes without saying um, especially as lockdown starting to lift right now um, there's been a really amazing public backup of the NHS and the clap for carers is fantastic but um, I don't know about you but I'm quite pleased that it's over now because of the um, pressure and the expectation that it puts on us all and um, if, if anyone is is like some of my neighbours who I'm really really hoping will behave themselves in the background as I do this evening webinar everyone's been simmering everyone's been massively waiting to get out there um, and the pictures from I think it was Bournemouth Beach today are, are kind of testament to that um, people are a bit confusing um, people are, are kind of uh, mixing um, the dealing with the, the public health mixed messages and the government mixed messages and the devolved nations mixed messages as well as someone working and living in Wales and it's really shifted everything for everyone so the tension is there and I think that's what's so different for those of you who've worked in critical care during other outbreaks is we've never had this kind of social change that's come with it before. And pretty early on um, I got involved with the British Psychological Society doing this but also with the Intensive Care Society looking at almost a prediction and what I came up with it was with a group of other sort of expert psychologists was this idea of phasing and we originally talked about that kind of building phase that core active phase and then the phase of recovery but we don't we feel like we're in coexistence rather than recovery and in essence I, I think what we've gone through is that kind of that first wave of anticipatory anxiety but also heroics and the joy of that and feeling like yes we can do this we can find a way I find most people right now as they're wondering about the second wave and wondering what is the future they're in this lull period of disillusionment and this lull period of, of kind of wondering what if um, and and I think a lot of people are actually pretty exhausted actually they've given all their discretionary re-effort there's there's nothing left to give 
Um, and of course, you know, what about this second wave? I, I just read some Welsh government stuff this um, just today about uh, the, the kind of reasonable worst case scenario um, and trying to make sense of that um, for my local ICU and, and you know, get, can we do this again, these high numbers again, in the midst of exhaustion, but also in the midst of where all the things that were really great that shifted and changed in terms of lifting the red tape and yes, we can attitude of, of the hospital, for me, feels like it's returned to type somewhat. Everyone's retreated back to their safe silos in, in some areas. Um, and actually, do, do we have the energy of our colleagues around us to, to do this again? And, you know, like all good psychologists, I like to bring in a little bit of a theory to help make sense of how we're feeling right now. And as a kind of preamble to the stories that will come up, this is probably quite a, a useful model more broadly and generally, and it's used quite a bit, which is the job demand resource model for understanding why people burn out at work. And in essence, it's thinking about that kind of that broader stress dynamic of when our demands and resources are imbalanced. This is when our demands and resources are out of balance. Um, and those resources are not just about us and not just about our self care. They're all uh, those sort of personal resources. They're also about the way the job is shaped and the way the system is reacting and supplying resources. And so you can think of you know, the resources of staffing and redeployed staffing, the resources of uh, kind of national and international interconnectedness at the moment, the resources of stopping things like elective surgery and creating capacity. Um, but there's also the kind of the balance of the demands, the trauma, um, the younger patient that resonates with us, um, the lack of families around that make us feel like we, we kind of almost we have to do even more of the emotional work but we also feel so um just, just so bereft for our patients that they don't have their loved ones near and you know get get these out of balance and that they're, they're incredibly um worrying and and we know that our, our staff are potentially at, at risk of burnout and, and didn't start from a very good place anyway um according to our research but Get it, get it right and actually people are really engaged and can feel a sense of ability and drive and performance and joy. So that's a really important thing to say right now. If you're kind of thinking, I don't know why I don't feel like everyone else, actually maybe you've got that balance right. And maybe it actually feels for the first time in years you can do your job properly because of the resources that have been liberated for you to, to work with your patients. But Actually, this this quote came. Um, I don't actually have permission for this, so no one retweet it. But um, I read um, this quote from Rana Audish, and I really massively related to that this week, um, which is slowly realizing how many of the arguments I've had um, in the past few months were um, were really me just screaming, "What if I'm not actually enough to sustain you people who have no one and nothing else right now? Then what?" And I think there has been this incredible um, pressure on us to, to, to really meet that challenge. And certainly for me as a psychologist, my kind of um, staff referral rate has gone through the roof. It's tripled during this time. And this sort of sense of that um, pressure on, our, uh, on ourselves to, to perform um, and to do well and how that affects us. And I just think Rana Aldish just gets it really with that quote. Um, so we know um, it's no surprise to you if it is a surprise to you. Um, sadly, I think sometimes you te uh, um, uh, teach to the converted on a well-being webinar. But we know when, when your system is out of balance, it's not just emotional, it's physiological, it's cognitive and it's relational as well. So I bet a lot of you right now are dealing with the poor bandwidth that I can feel myself that's only just really now returning. Um, I remember people saying to me, don't write anything longer than two sentences in an email because you're lucky if they're reading it right now, but people just can't process this information, um, but also that sort of sense of the, the kind of relationships that are coming together, but maybe a lot of us are feeling relational strain, especially with our home lives right now. 
And just a few little stats, not to, to get too depressing, but it's worth knowing um, the kind of long term risks of this looking at um, China. So the, the Lou reference looking at a matter synthesis of all previous pandemics, Alan, and looking at a really interesting story of SARS and Canada with Bob Mondo, who's a great writer. Um, what you have is, is your range of potential long term risks. And I've just simplified um, the data for you there. Um, so we don't have data on the moral injury risk, um, but the burnout syndrome risk is one in three. Post-traumatic stress right now is one in four, but over 12 months it's anticipated that goes down to one in 10. Uh, low mood, depression, one in three and anxiety, one in three. So a good rule of thumb that for every colleague you see that there is another colleague that is struggling. So I want to share with you with my colleagues and hand you over to my colleagues now who are gonna talk about the highs and the lows and their own personal experience. So I will just mute myself after handing over to Shond. Hi. Um, I don't know if I, are you can put the camera on me. No, okay. Camera's on. <laughs> All right, brilliant. Uh, my name's Shand. I'm a critical care consultant at Lancashire Teaching Hospitals, which is Royal Preston Hospital up in the north of England. And I've been a consultant there for about 13 years. So like, it's been an interesting journey for me because I had been a clinical director at the Trust for five years, covering the unit and anaesthesia. And at the end of that, you suddenly realise what you have to do to get anything changed in the NHS. The, the amount of bureaucracy and the amount of engagement you have to get from not just your colleagues, but from other departments, from the management, even if everyone's in agreement, it's, it's a huge pressure and you do it day in day out and i was fairly obsessive you know i was sending emails at two in the morning so when i finished that i was wiped out and i and i basically disengaged from stuff that was happening in my department did my clinical job went home and i came to the ics because i thought do you know what maybe i can achieve more through a national gateway than I can through a, a local one. And the interesting thing about COVID is that when it started, we could all see it happening in China, in, you know, in January, we could all see it happening in February. And then it gets to Italy in about end of February, March. And most of the clinicians I'm talking to are starting to get a bit nervous. Most of the nursing staff are seeing it on the news and get, and get a bit nervous. But nationally, there's very little recognition. Now the trusts have to do what they're told from a national perspective. And so throughout the country, we were seeing trusts that were very slow to do stuff because it wasn't coming from a, a national perspective. And then all of a sudden, everything changed within a few days everything completely flipped and suddenly we were being asked to do loads of things and i'm bloody glad i wasn't a clinical director at that point because i you know my colleagues are a fantastic bunch but they were tasked with doing an awful lot very rapidly yeah i was sitting on on a national perspective and we were busy trying to set up forums for the clinical leads to engage and all the stuff around PPE and, and just dealing with the media. And, and the fascinating thing about it is you suddenly realize no one has a clue what you do. Uh, I've kind of known that for a long time. I don't think my mother knew what I did. And, uh, um, so I'm not surprised. So we, I found myself, going on TV and the radio and newspapers, trying to explain what we did in critical care. Um, and as you're all aware, because I imagine most of you work on a critical care unit somewhere, um, it's not all good. 
and there's quite a lot of bad in it. So that was a real challenge. The other thing that came out of it was that the things you were expecting were going to be a problem, the things like staffing and resources, some of that we could kind of see coming. People like me, I've been in a very new consultant when during the flu pandemic. So I remember recoveries being full of inventilated patients. Um, and I remember them at kind of mortality rates. But again, in, in a hospital like mine, where we have good respiratory departments, we, the, the burden was being was shared 10 years ago. But this was unpredictable. You know, new things were being thrown at us. What kind of PPA? We haven't got enough PPE. We haven't got enough ventilators. You know, and people were taking little things. And suddenly, I was spending a Sunday afternoon explaining what proning was or what happened to the oxygen piping. <laughs> Just fascinating stuff, but you know, it's not something you ever expect to be talking about. The other thing that I've really struggled with throughout this is the communication side of it. Breaking bad news, which pretty much is a consultant's job on the whole, or a senior doctor's job, or a senior nurse's job, is around how you talk to them and your body language. Um, in one foul swoop, we removed the body language. And so we had to do that conversation over the phone. And for those of you who've seen my name, I had a couple of times where people didn't want to speak to me. They wanted to speak to someone English, basically, or with an English sounding name. And it was just, a, it's very hard to have a conversation where they just completely mistrust you. So the, the patient side of it is an absolute disaster. I, I, mean, I don't know a good way of doing it. And then there was the conversations with the staff. Now, specialities from other departments were all coming with patients that they thought we could escalate on. And it's, you know, the joys of ICNARC and the way we collect data that we're, we're starting to get outcome data that we can comprehensively go, look, I think this is a bad idea in this population group. But to start off with, we just didn't know. You know, we knew what we knew about our, our frail patients and we, and so, and having other comorbidities, but we didn't, that, that wasn't sufficient to, for another specialty to say, to say to another specialty, we're not going to take your patient even though we were running out of beds at an alarming rate. So those things were really frustrating about work. There were some pretty cool stuff though. I mean, like I said, I've been pretty disillusioned with, or become disinterested in working and kind of furthering the department's aims. And this is something that was really interesting, really new. I could contribute both on a national level and on a local level you know, I was the lead for the research and suddenly research became a fantastic way of bringing all the teams together in the hospital, recruiting people to recovery, recruiting people to remap cap and, and genomics and all the new other COVID trials that are coming through. I have just seen an entire hospital do critical care research, which is great. I mean, I'm very happy with that, but it's been a, an unbelievable thing and team working, you know, there was no way of, you, you, you have to get your hands dirty, you have to go into the bays, you have to play with the patients, you have to do stuff. You can't tell the trainees what to do. When you're intubating someone, it probably, it probably needs to be the most senior person putting a tube in. So, you know, when I was on, it was me. So we knew that. And in the back of your mind, it made me a lot happier to be able to do stuff like that. There's also that recognition of what I do being important, which, and, uh, and the, there's, you know, there's uh, plenty of times where I don't think anyone thinks of intensive care as a, as a, its own speciality, and, but now they do. So those kind of things have been fantastic. And the way I have seen the nurses and the allied health professionals, the psychologists, the pharmacists, our librarian, They've all come in and said, what can we do to help? You know, the anaesthetic department put a, a rotor on for us and provided us an extra consultant uh, over the weekends on the weekdays. Consultants that had left intensive care came back to work. Nurses that had left 
physios who were academic were coming in and helping. We were getting, we got, I mean, we got more research done and we got more care delivered um, in two or three months than I've, I've seen in several years. So I'm really pleased by that. Then there's a personal side to it. I'm a fairly obsessive kind of guy. When I start going, I don't really stop. Um, I was WhatsApping until two, three in the morning. I was on um, Zoom meetings and, and Microsoft meetings, and I just didn't really stop. Uh, it wasn't until my wife pointed out to me that I don't think she's had a conversation with me for about three weeks that I kind of went, oh, never mind. And the kids were just going, well, you're glued to your phone permanently and that's caused a real trouble because we haven't we i've got three kids i've got a wife who's a surgeon my kids haven't been sent to school i didn't think that was the right thing to do and we've kept them at home but actually homeschooling them when you're distracted or trying to organize it around meetings isn't fair on them and isn't fair on on you either because you never get any downtime and i didn't realize how much i enjoyed having my days off with the kids at school you know, I'd have a guitar lesson, I'd go on my bike, I'd go for a run, I'd just veg in front of the TV. I had downtime, I just, and you don't get that much anymore. Then you don't, you realise what it's like not to see your friends at all. So I can't go to my local pub quiz anymore. I can't, you know, tonight would have been a lovely night for sitting in, in, in uh, the local pub in the garden and chatting to your friends. Just not happening. My, my year six son has missed or in these, I mean, no school parties. He's had, he spent a week at school with his friends. That's it. So you see all of this stuff and it's a disaster, but all the exciting stuff that's happening kind of makes up for it, but you don't sleep, you don't, you, you focus on your work, you know? So I'm pretty happy with what I've achieved. But I do wonder what expense it is. And with the second wave, you do wonder whether I can do it all again. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I think my time is up. So I'm going to pass it on. Julie, do you want to introduce the next Lovely. speaker? Thank you, Sean. OK, so over to Shagan. Hello, everyone. Um... My name is Shagan. I am an intensive care registrar and currently critical care echo fellow working at BART in London. And my experience of COVID-19 was probably slightly different from Sean's. Um, I will I actually wrote this all down in a reflection for my portfolio, the ever, the ever looming trainee portfolio, which got published on um, which Bart's Health actually published as a blog piece on our local blog. So I will, if it's okay with everyone, I will read from that. Um, so I actually wrote this, I wrote this about three weeks ago now. The last month has been a real challenge. I had very limited experience of severe acute respiratory failure having only personally been involved in the care of a few patients during the H1N1 pandemic. Um, when it occurred in, two, 20, in 2009 now, I was in Stoke Mandeville Hospital. And by the time I was doing ICU, they didn't really have very many patients. So seeing so many patients with such severe respiratory failure that COVID-19 brought was exciting, humbling and scary. And this actually took a toll on me in many forms. As a clinician, it was hard. Patients were very sick, requiring multidisciplinary input, often quite rapidly. One occasion had me helping to deprone a patient only to watch them rapidly spiral into respiratory failure, necess necessitating a call to the consultant who rushed in and placed them on VV ECMO. Other occasions had me ringing family members in the early hours of the morning to involve them with the sad news of the impending death of their loved one. Being removed from the humanizing presence of relatives was very difficult. It was very, very difficult for me. Um, it's easy to underestimate how much the presence of family or the presence of people who love your patients remind you how human they are. 
and so it was wonderful when families were able to send me pictures of how their relatives normally looked in the times BC before COVID. As a black man, it was very difficult intubating and managing many people who looked and sounded just like me and often came from my part of the world in West Africa. I've mostly worked in the UK in intensive care and in, I've never ventilated as many West Africans in my entire life as I have in the last month. And as a result, that took a toll on me. I had sleepless nights wondering if I would be next or my family would be next and what I would do. Um, I wrote my will. As a husband, I had to watch my wife grow gray with worry at the prospect of me w walking into work every day with a significant risk of catching a disease that seemed to have an unnatural predilection for black people. And eventually, at the end of March, I did actually succumb to COVID-19 and had two weeks of being off work. Thankfully, my illness was mild. Um, my wife nursed me back to health. And she watched me every day, um, literally just waiting to pick up the phone if anything went wrong. As a son with elderly, patient, with elderly parents in Nigeria, I pleaded with my family to maintain social distancing and stay safe. And they in turn worried themselves sick when I got symptoms and they called me every day. As a friend and colleague, I sadly lost a former colleague and listened to the stories of my friends who lost theirs. Just like Sean said, it was very difficult to switch off. WhatsApp was constantly pinging and we were all talking all the time. And it, it was wonderful to share at the same time it was heartbreaking. And also, I'm still a trainee, so I had training objectives. I have, I'm supposed to be doing an advanced critical care echo fellowship. And this got suspended because, well, patients came first. Um, so I stopped doing my echo logbook, focus on delivering intensive care, the best way I knew how to. Now, as the peak slows, and as we look forward to returning to some semblance of normality, I'm still not relaxed yet. Maybe these are symptoms of hypervigilance from stress. Maybe I'm worried about a second peak. I can't tell. Um, what I do hope is that I can take the lessons that I've learned and the experiences that I've had and make them and use them to become a better human being, husband and doctor. And that's my story. Thank you, Shagan. That's lovely. Okay, so our next story is from Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Jonathan Down, and I'm an advanced critical care practitioner in the Midlands. Um, I have had um, anxiety and depression in the past. Uh, it loomed. Um, when I did a placement in accident and emergency for 18 months. Um, I overcame it that time um, with a bit of a struggle, um, but I did overcome it, moved on to my love. Uh, I was back to being an advanced critical care practitioner and I love my job. Um, the problem was that I found myself gradually declining during the COVID crisis. I was kind of following it really from China onwards. So I was tracking it from January onwards and was waiting for it to come, knowing it would become, I think I was perhaps aware of it before a lot of other people were so aware. And maybe I became a bit obsessed with it. I struggled with lots of things during COVID. It was all, like Shonda said, a little bit exciting to start with. It's all very different. But there were many things that were difficult. To name a few, the PPE, the doffing and the donning, behind a face mask, behind a shield, shouting at each other, working in operating theatres with ventilators that probably weren't the best ventilator for your patients, with nurses that were stressed, looking after one to three, one to four patients, the wonderful theatre staff and staff from other areas of the hospital helping out who were fabulous, a call to them, they were marvellous. Phone calls with the relatives, 
And the phone calls I took from the relatives, they were always very apologetic for calling. I'm sorry, I know you're busy. Would you mind telling me how my relative is? I won't keep you long. Thank you for your help. Each one of those picked away at the edges a little, to be honest. Um, I could never be dismissive. You shouldn't be calling. We're going to be calling you is what I often heard. I couldn't do that. I'd take the call and I'd treat that person as if they were the most important person in the world because I can't imagine what it was like on their side. There was the several incidents I was involved in, all of which were just simply because we were so busy working in an environment that we weren't familiar with, with patients that were all critically ill, with staff that weren't so familiar with the unit. And it was filling out of incident forms and statements for the coroner picked away at the edges too. There was the removal of a lot of the roles that I'm used to as an advanced critical care practitioner. And I'm not critical of this, it was the right thing to do, but there was an airway team, there was a line team, there was a transfer team. Now that's 60% of my work that's been handed over to other people. And then suddenly I found myself wondering what I was there for. I could do some things, of course I could. I could write prescriptions, I could, I could do patient assessments, I could try and dictate their care, but much of my role had disappeared. And, and there was a feeling of loss as a consequence and of a feeling of what am I contributing to this? As I said, I did become a bit obsessed with COVID. Um, I was watching the news as we all were probably. I was listening to the daily briefings. I was watching YouTube videos. And I managed probably okay for three to four weeks. When we reached a peak, the hospital I worked at was probably one of the busiest in the Midlands. Uh, we were shipping patients out as quickly as they were coming in to provide space for them. And I found myself driving to work one morning and I made the mistake of listening to a, uh, a podcast from a survivor of intensive care. And I just found myself in tears, um, sobbing uncontrollably. And I just had to turn the car around and come home. That was eight weeks ago. Since then, I've started, my GP has been brilliant. My boss has been brilliant. My work colleagues have been brilliant. Everyone's been so supportive. I've had many messages from people on Twitter and email and texts. I've been prescribed another course of medications. I'm having counseling every week. I'm trying to learn to meditate. The anxiety can be overwhelming. You wake up in the morning and it's like you've been punched in the stomach. Anyone who asks you what you feel anxious about doesn't really understand what anxiety is because you just don't know what you feel anxious about. You just feel anxious and that anxiety makes you feel lower and lower and lower. And there's guilt in the background as well. I've been away for eight weeks. My colleagues at work have carried on. Now I know, and everybody reassures me that I shouldn't feel guilty, but you can't stop that from happening. You do feel guilty. Am I better? I don't know. I was hoping to go back to work next week, but I've taken another week's annual leave. Will I go back? Yes, I think so. The plan is that I go back and dip my toe very carefully into the not so cold waters now. I'm hoping they won't get cold again. The future, I don't know. But one thing I can say is that the most important people are those people that are around you. And if you are struggling and feeling the same as me, you have to tell people. Because those people care about you. They want to help you. And they will not judge you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That was really powerful. Okay. So our last story is from Karen. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Karen. I am an advanced nurse practitioner um, 
in the hospital down south and um, my story is kind of into four um, sections when I thought about it or four stages my kind of in father's story um, and like everybody else um, at the beginning of this uh, we were ramping up um, intensive care facilities um, very rapidly and I got asked to um, deliver training to any and all staff that was coming in to um, help critical care and um, we had a weekend to sort out the training when we were told we'd have to start delivering it on the Monday and across a week we essentially trained over 200, 200 close to 230 um, staff um, so that was pretty hard going um, and quite exhausting um, at times and I think one of my lowest points um, during that initial period was uh, um, going home after work, stopping for some food. I live on my own. I'm, I'm a, um, I shop on a daily basis. Um, so going home, wanting to just stop for some food and st stood outside a uh, shop in a queue for 20 minutes to try and go in. And when I went in, I couldn't decide what I needed to buy. I was starving um, and walked out without any food, sat in my car and cried. And that was most probably the lowest point at the beginning. Two weeks later, I got diagnosed or went off sick with um, COVID-19 symptoms. And after a week of trying to sort out testing, was eventually tested and had to wait for a week, a week for my results um, and then turned out positive. Throughout this, I had to decide to tell my parents who was in South Africa, she, um, also in lockdown. I had to make a decision whether I told them whether I'm positive or not, because I knew my mum would go absolutely mental with the thought of me positive with a disease that um, was had such a high mortality rate, appeared to have such a high mortality rate across the world. And on one side, I was thinking, oh, who's going to pack up my house if I um, succumb to COVID-19? And who's going to sort out all my accounts or anything? Because I've never shared any of my accounts or anything with anybody. Um, who's going to get my parents across to the UK if something happens to me, they can't fly, um, what would happen to them? Um, and like everybody else, I was um, clued up to social media and watching everything that was going on across the daily briefing things, things. And I actually had to say after a while to just stop. I couldn't handle all the, um, all the information that was being bombarded at you. Um, listening to your colleagues that had work that struggling with PPE and um, having a hard time looking after really sick patients and the emotional burden that they were going through. But here we are, we're coming towards the end and we've survived, we're still here. And I think my the kind of last stage is now is the loss, I feel is the loss of human contact. Um, you don't catch up with your friends, you, don't, um, you can't hug anybody that you haven't seen people that are shielding that you haven't seen for 90 days or something and um, thoughts of what they are going through um, and the, kind of the outside wider world how have they coped people that's um, potentially lo losing their job and um, the stress of having to look after their kids at home not going to work I and mean, to some extent I guess we were lucky um, because we were able to go to work we were able to continue um, more or less um, what we do on a daily basis compared to a lot of people that everything just came to a standstill um, and it's really, um, you can really see the um, emotional and psychological burden um, across, um, uh, across the spectrum, actually, that people are facing. And I think that's really hard. Um, and uh, hopefully there's an end in sight and there's a light at the end of the tunnel and um, we can step out of this and um, carry on and kind of form, uh, I hate to say that word, a new normal, but... Um, one of the slides that I had on here was some about um, the uh, kind of loss cycle. And I think to some extent, um, I was certainly grieving for um, our, our normal reality that we were having day to day and the things you couldn't do. Um, and you had to change so many aspects of your life. Um, and we've got no idea what it's going to look like in two months, three months, a year's time. Um, and just trying to take one step at a time. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Sean, Shagan, Jonathan, Karen. Really, really 
powerful stories, um, all sides um, of the joy and pain that everyone has been through. And I'm sure so many people of our audience can really relate to what you're saying um, and really um, it really resonates with them and I think it's it's very hard it's especially hard for me as a psychologist when people turn to me and say how do we cope and the reality is is that we've never seen anything like this before so it's so hard to give any advice that doesn't feel crass in terms of coping um, but there there is a sense and people have, have kind of coined the phrase of emotional PPE um, and that sense that we need to protect ourselves in some way. And I, I, I guess I, I tried to just kind of pull out four key themes of emotional PPE um, and to, to make it easier, they all actually begin with P as well. Um, I think, you know, we started this pandemic and I put out a, a message and that message came from the World Health Organization of permission that it's okay to not be okay and I wanted to put it in and say no really it's it's still okay to not be okay and everyone is having moments now and everyone is struggling and I think in permission just hearing um, Karen and uh, kind of talking about not seeing anyone socially for a while I think one of the things that I've noticed people really um, are missing is that sort of sense of sense checking um, and how we need people we need people to give us permission and we need our go-to peers and the problem is in, in ICU is our peers are often in it with us so our go-to peer might actually be um, someone in a totally different um, situation. We would often talked about pacing and I think you know we were all secretly hoping for one big spike and we're done um, and the reality is with, with flattening the curve and lengthening this out is that this this is here with us for some time and that that new normal that people referred to and the only way to really deal with that is to find your rhythm with that and find some pace and some routine and some way of stepping away stepping away from work stepping away from social media um and at the start i i uh, got the phrase from um from a consultant up north who said this is a, a marathon not a sprint and then someone said no surely it's a triathlon um because we've sent in the swimmers um or maybe the sprinters and now we need the swimmers um, and what about the cyclists, you know, actually with that kind of wave, actually we, we can't keep going for 26 miles and, and, and not fall down at the finishing line. We need to, we need to pace ourselves. And processing is a really important thing psychologically. However we can, the stories we're sharing tonight is about making sense of what we've been through, um, sharing stories at work, in team Zooms, team talks, reflective rounds, whatever way, um, over a socially distanced coffee, um, but also thinking about the way in which we work through this in our minds when we're not talking and our nonverbal working through. And this is where kind of gardening for many people who are lucky enough to have a garden, that's their savior or going for a run or a walk or a cycle. It's kind of, finding that way of kind of working it through, churning it through and making sense and not blocking. Um, and, and watching out for your colleagues who are the quiet ones who are perhaps processing on their own um, and inviting them in, but not making them open up and not making them talk, but giving them permission and permission for peers there. And then overall, kind of sense of perspective you know I go back to the Rana Audish quote and I hear it in each of our four speakers of am I enough and actually that it's really really important to say you know we're doing the best we can with what we have and we need to sense check that and advise that with each other and I think we, you know, the Intensive Care Society are fantastic in that they've really recognised for some time how important well-being is in critical care. Um, and I'm in a really lucky position to, to direct and lead a national project. And I just wanted to give you a flavour of what we want to do um, and what this has really sped up the process of. Um, and in essence, we're, we're looking at kind of trying to embed 
well-being and psychological care in every ICU in the UK if we can um, and some of that is about reaching out like this in webinars in education and resources and it's not just about giving you top tips it's also thinking about getting your teams back together supporting your leaders um, the next step is really thinking about how we enable um, peers to come together in a more formalized and a more informed peer support framework and how we as a society can support that and then of course to think about for, for the few that benefit from it and require it um, that direct access to that embedded psychological care so short term how the intensive care society can link people into that and long term how we can get more people with that skill set within ICU. So we just wanted to introduce you to that, but um, you'll see more information. I'm only at the middle of week two, so you'll see more information coming out really quickly. But there's my email address. If, if you have a unit that is interested in this, um, please don't all email me 10 people from one unit, but if you could collect kind of thoughts and energies together and, and try and email me as one, that would be really great. I'd really be interested to hear from you. Um, and I wanted to, to have a thank you to everyone for the Intensive Care Society and I was looking for a thank you um, that wasn't Sandy's video and then I came across this photo of myself <laughs> which kind of made me giggle and I, I was aware that this would feel quite weighty this webinar so I just put this in slightly to entertain myself at the end um, just a kind of a, a smiley geeky photo of me at the end but thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts all of us for, for the speakers this evening but for all of you for everything that you do um, so I'll stop sharing my screen now and we'll co go to a, a kind of Q&A session um, with, the, um, with the group. So feel free guys to, to switch your microphones off, but you don't have to put your videos back on if you don't wish to. Um, and I think Shagan, you're going to take us through some of the questions that have come up for the panel. Okay. Um... So yeah, once again, I'll echo Julie's thoughts. Thank you so much to everybody for sharing your stories. I was really quite moved actually. Um, and well, everyone here has just been a hero and people who are listening are certainly heroes as well. Um, so first question comes um, from Hell John. And it was a question about, uh, probably Julie are the best person to take this. Um, I wondered what you thought had to be tweaked within our usual psychological models to help people with trauma and distress when we as psychologists are also part of the social event that's going on. Yeah, yeah. I think this is one of the hardest things at the moment uh, for the, the people who are helping people in this situation is that we're in it with you. And that's um, often not the case. I think even when we're in it with you in the intensive care, if we're intensive care societies, um, I, I think, you know, um, we're, we're kind of one step removed somewhat. Um, and I, I think it's hard to know how to adapt it because I, I, I imagine we're going to end up adapting it in retrospect really but what you do when um it's not vicarious traumatization it's co-traumatization and how you bring forward as a psychologist as a psychological therapist um your theoretical framework and you hold safely your lived experience and i think that's that's the really tricky thing i i would say personally um, in the years that I've worked in intensive care, my own personal vicarious traumatization of, the, the, of just working with the families and patients anyway, has enriched my ability to empathize with staff. I just always have to hold back my assumptions um, that it's the same for them as it is for me. And I think that's, that's the key is, is kind of thinking about how we can share a lived experience, but hold back on assumptions. So those are just my kind of start of a 10 thoughts on that. I think you've answered both of Hal John's questions quite nicely, actually, with the second one being about how exactly, as you said, how we hold that space on a busy ward. Mm -hmm. um, got a couple of questions from our favorite Twitter person and rehab legend, Mark Hudson. Hey, Mark, thanks for tuning in. Um, he asked a really pertinent question to start with. 
Um, he is an ICU survivor, and he says that what we're describing sounds very much like post-intensive care syndrome and some of the PTSD that he sees or he's experienced or heard about. Um, do you feel lessons and experiences learned from the post-intensive care syndrome community can be, can be converted into helping those who looked after who are the carers for patients? Wow, that's a clever question. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take first tips at that, but I'd be really interested from the non-psychology perspective. I think what I take from that is something that we call a syndrome is a syndrome because it's a cluster of things that co occur, but it is not a diagnosis. Um, and I think that's really important in that what we learn is that for each individual, there is a uniqueness to that and there is their own experience and what they bring and there are elements of similarity and I think what what you hear in our stories is is that we are um, th there are elements of post-traumatic stress or, or I would say hyper stimulation actually and, and not being able to switch off is not necessarily the trauma of it but the kind of go 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 of it. I think, you know, we have elements of the exhaustion and fatigue, but for very, very different reasons to a post ICU patient, um, but for the, the physical kind of strain that our bodies have gone through. But we also bring our own experience of that, our own ICU unit, our own families, our own home life. So I, I can see, I can see the useful metaphor and comparison, but I think the thing that I would take from it is a cluster of symptoms may co-occur and we may have things in common, but we all bring our own unique experience to that. So you, Sean, can I say you, like you want to say something? Yeah, go on, Sean. yeah. Um, it worries me that it does look like some kind of post-traumatic stress. I mean, don't forget that most people that work on critical care have volunteered to go and work on critical care on the whole. There are a group of people that have had to do it and there's a group of people like me and all my AHP and nursing colleagues that have volunteered to do it and we love our job. And we see death, 40% of intensive care unit, the patients die. We see death and have conversations about death. Um, we see major trauma, big traffic. We see people crashing in front of you. Um, so it, we have to find a way of dealing with it. Mm. Yeah, it's not something that we, that's going to go away. And, you know, I'm late forties now. I've still got another 15, 20 years of this. <laughs> I don't want to be completely broken at the end of it. We've got to keep you going, Sean. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. It's like, so I think, first of all, is that, but secondly, there are folks that intentionally never wanted to go anywhere near an intensive care unit because they know it's, they have insight, probably less, more than I do. Um, and those people, you, I really worry about. I know we've dragged consultants back onto intensive care units where it's clearly not good for their health. And, and, and they, they struggle with, you know, they, the decision-making and all the ethics and, the, and, and the, all the, that kind of stuff. It's, it's a real struggle for them. And, and it's how we support them to a certain degree, as well as how we support our, our, our future population. And I suspect if a second wave does hit, this will be the reason why no one wants to come back and help us. Mm. That's one of my big worries, actually, for a second. If, if we don't get this right now, look after ourselves now, um, yeah, if a second wave comes, who's going to help us? Who's going to want to come back after this? something um i know you're talking about the as critical care we used to um look you know we're used to facing uh, death and making uh, uh decisions and things but i think what for me what was missing is the fact that there's the emotional burden that we carry um like julie said that when there's no there's no family and friends there um that is that's there with a the patient um so often you can distance a little bit um, from that because the family is looking after the patient and things where in this scenario we kind of had to do both we had to be there for the patient as much as what they might not have known or known that you were there um, as well as for the family that couldn't be there you had to be um, their connection between their loved one 
and then um, and suddenly on the wards uh, for the patients that didn't make it into intensive care to help support um, those staff with patients that are rapidly deteriorating um, uh, again with no family or support um, there for them and it was and it seemed quite relentless and you didn't have a break from day to day mm. um, which to me is, is quite different from what we normally face in intensive care Absolutely. I, I think you're right, Karen. And I think um, for me, there is something in almost the family creates quite a, an emotional buffer for us normally yeah. and enable us to take a step back. And I, I over the years, I've been trying to kind of suss out what makes what makes the right combination of, of characteristics for someone who's a critical care lifer. And I think it's the ability to step forward and empathize and the ability to step back. Yeah, yeah like <laughs> Sean's <laughs> laughing at me now. But that, that kind of connect in, connect out really safely and flexibly. And yeah. I think when we connect in too far, then we almost go down the rabbit hole a little bit. And that's when it really strikes us. And, and I, I, you know, hearing in, in each of your stories, kind of there's, there is that element of we, we can get kind of too drawn in. Um, and it's, it's important that we are able to take a step back to now. And I, I think... You know, it's good that we're in a quieter, shouldn't say that word in the ICU period, but um, I think this is the time to take a step back for people. The problem is, is some people will take a big step back and not want to come back again. Mm. Um, so it's get that balance right. Go on, Sean, you, you look moved to talk. Well, it was just the, um, it was one of the earlier comments about how you engage with people to talk mm. about it. Um, I know in my department and everywhere else, it's, it's a hard one. We, you know, you can't do debrief. We, one of my suggestions was, well, we'll debrief at the end of, end of a shift. The end of a bloody shift, I'm tired. I want to go home. I want to see my kids and I want to have some dinner and go to bed <laughs> before tomorrow. I don't want to debrief, you know, and I suspect there are, so I don't, and it's when you address it, what you need to do is have that conversation in the cold light of day. But I don't want to go back into the hospital to have that conversation. I bet, I bet none of my colleagues working mm. in a hospital want to want yeah. to go back and, and do that. I, I've had counselling before many years ago, and it you know I had it over the telephone, and it's you know, and it's fairly it is helpful, but your problem is you have to be forced to do it. I mean, the people that actually need it probably don't even ask for it until it's they're well down the path, and and I, and I don't know how we get folk involved yeah. earlier because we are, you know i i thought i was suffering a bit from the stress and then you talk to you i talk to the nursing staff and the other consultants and the and the, and the, and the uh, other doctors in our hospital in our unit and in the anesthetic department and they're all suffering mm. in in different ways it's just that i can be more vocal than others i guess but mm. how do you get them on board and engaged it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because in many ways, that's about shifting our um, kind of feeling in our, our units, isn't it? Where we, we almost yeah. talk about these things more freely. Um, I and I shift. think generally our staff have a strong sense of um, wanting to cope and I can cope. Um, at the most extreme, it's our kind of ICU man up culture. But, you know, even in the middle of all of that, we, we're tough people and we, we don't like to admit when we're struggling. Um, I mean, I, I, I personally, one of the things I've massively missed because of, of the way the PPE is, is just walking through the unit freely and people just catching me. And I think that that makes a big difference if you've got someone who's just knocking around versus you have to make the concerted effort to go and ask for help is very different thing. Um, I see someone's kind of made a comment about debriefs and, and of course the, the evidence base is quite contentious about debriefs and we would say don't enforce a debrief, actually don't make people talk um, because that can be more harmful um, people will find their own ways of making sense of it but I think it's giving permission for people to talk if they wish to um, so your end of shift huddle is a really useful idea for just kind of going right almost sort of decant the day if you like and sort of say right we're done now thanks everyone great shift but actually if you get into the nitty-gritty of all, what's happened on shift that's not necessarily that helpful and as you say you're dying to get home and get showered and uh, 
get your family. You've kind of answered one of Mark's other questions there about whether we feel the PPE is a barrier to us, um, to us being able to share about our experiences. And it sounds like very clearly it is. Yeah. Um, we're not able to have a, you know, have a hug and, you know, get a pat on the back the way that we could do before COVID when we were feeling a bit, you know, when we were feeling, when we, when we had our moments. But you, it's hard to even see, make that eye contact and see people give you that look, mm. even, you know, from across the shop floor, you just, you don't see it. Um, and if you're not seeing it in the corridor, then where's your opportunity? That is, that has been hard. And, and the environment, your familiar environment has all changed. Mm. So, you know, what was a, a nice ward area, it's suddenly been cordoned off and there's fake doors in place and there's seals in place everywhere. And suddenly, and you're in full PPE feeling like a scuba diver or a spokesman. You can't hear anything very well. I'm, a hard, I'm very deaf anyway. So I, couldn't, I couldn't tell what anybody was saying to me. Mm. To the point where I would do pretty much all my ward round outside without PPE on, put my PPE on and then do a kind of second ward round and then go a third ward round where I went back outside and discussed everything we did inside. Just because any kind of long convoluted conversation wasn't going to happen in there. Mm. And it was, it's a disaster. You can't, you, you, can't make, you, make, you can't make friends. You've got new nurses who are scared. So, sorry to interrupt, John. Just to say Jonathan's got to um, head off now. Jonathan, do you want to say any last comments before you have to head off? I think he's already gone. Sorry no. about that. Sorry to interrupt you, John. Uh, no, no, John. no, no, no. I think probably before we wrap up, because um, it's 10 past eight now. Yeah. Um, and thank you everyone for staying with us. Um, it's a question from one of our pediatric ICU colleagues um, where they, um, she says, or they say, they've just started their journey in PQ with wellbeing. Um, and they're wondering how, if, if and how the stuff from adults, and they say, we seem to be ahead in some ways, um, that can help. Um, well, I, I work in PICU as well as adults. Um, so everything I learn, I learn across the two. I guess, you know, PICU has been hit very differently um, in, in terms of this. Um, but actually, it's, it's been incredibly stressful for them too. Um, the generic stuff I put on the Intensive Care Society website that isn't COVID specific works everywhere. And it works in non-ICUs as well, to be fair. So, so that I, I would say have a look and pick and choose, really. Um, and I'm, I'm linked to the national group of um, pediatric critical care psychologists in wellbeing as well. So, um, so there, there, there will be stuff that would probably be just sharing across um, with PICS. So. In which case, the rest of the comments are all just thank yous to all the panelists for sharing their stories. Okay. And so thank you to everybody for the very kind comments. Thank you. I think thank, thank you everyone again. Um, I'm a bit hot now. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny evening. Thank you so much for giving your time um, and uh, listening to us. Thank you for all of our speakers for being so honest and for sharing um, their experiences um, and some really, really powerful and kind of um, heart-wrenching stories there, but also some sense of hope as well. So um, here's hoping for a mild second wave, but we do not what lies ahead. So let's take care of ourselves and each other. Um, and there will be more um, well-being webinars that come up that will be more specific as we go. Um, if you've got ideas and thoughts, please do um, give us a buzz on Twitter or on email. And take care and good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks to